I now call to order the society's 2406th meeting in the 149th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of DSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Dagomar de Groot in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Science's YouTube channel. We will begin with a few announcements, a reading of the minutes of the 2405th meeting and the lecture on blockchains in commerce by Ramis Gopinath. We will then turn to this evening's lecture followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. First, please join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2018-2019 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous donor who has asked to remain anonymous. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Cheryl Lohman, founder and CEO of Bedaptic LLC, broadly interested in the sciences and mathematics, who comes to PSW through the PSW meetup group. Calvin Z, a student at GMU, interested in technology applications and impacts, particularly blockchain implementations, who comes to PSW through his advisor at George Mason University. Adam Aloi, managing partner at Alliance, interested in statistics, big data, and astronomy, who comes to PSW through a member and friend of the Cosmos Club. Murdy Polavarat, who an electrical engineer interested primarily in microelectronics space applications and in quantum computing, who comes to PSW through the Washington Academy of Sciences. David Meyer, a scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, interested in atmospheric composition and dynamics, climate, and earth science informatics, who comes to PSW through PSW speaker member Compton Tucker. John Oravec, senior resolution advisor at the FDIC, interested in big data and blockchain, who learned of PSW through the announcement for Ramish Gopinath's lecture on blockchains in commerce, and tonight's speaker, Dagomar de Groot, whose background and interests will be clear to you in some small part from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to the society. There is a signed reprint of volume one of the PSW Bulletin for all new members and if you'd like to pick yours up, if you're a new member or a member who's never gotten one, please see me after the lecture, and I will be happy to give you one. These reprints of volume one are courtesy of the Policy Studies Organization. Recording Secretary James Ewan will now read the minutes of the 2405th meeting and the lecture by Ramis Gopinath on blockchains in commerce, <coughs> delivered here at the Cosmos Club on March 8th, 2009. James, podium is yours. Thanks, Larry. Hi, good evening. On March 8th, 2019, in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium and the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC, President Larry Milstein called the 2,405th meeting of the Society to order at eight o'clock p.m. He announced the order of business, that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet, and welcomed new members to the society. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Ramath Gopanath. 
Vice President for Blockchain Solutions at IBM. His lecture was titled, Blockchains in Commerce. Blockchain is a form of distributed ledger that Gopinath believes will fundamentally transform business processes in all industries. Traditional commerce occurs by parties transferring information point by point to one another. With blockchain, parties send the relevant information to a trusted, decentralized data store, thus ensuring that all parties share a single version of events and information. In so sharing information, Gopinath said transactions will be more efficient and fewer disputes will arise. The ledger technology for commerce is necessarily different than the technology for currency. Whereas cryptocurrency ledgers are permissionless and operated by anonymous entities, Gopinath said business desires to store data in a place with limited access managed by known parties. Gopinath then highlighted the enterprise blockchain technologies being produced by Oracle and IBM for financial services and the healthcare industry. He then focused on two supply chain solutions. Gopinath said the various parties in the farm to table supply chain share little to no information with each other. The lack of information sharing makes it difficult, for example, to trace contaminated lettuce to its source and identify where else it was distributed. When such events occur, the public loses trust in the food ecosystem. Responding to this circumstance, IBM developed the Food Trust Solution, a concept it demonstrated with the Walmart Mango in May 2017. They asked how long it took to trace a package of sliced mango back to its farm. The traditional mixed data, rather mixed digital and paper-based method took almost seven days to identify the mango's specific farm in Mexico. The IBM Food Trust blockchain solution identified the farm in 2.2 seconds. Gopinath said this pilot proved the IBM concept. IBM is now developing a similar process for multi-ingredient foods like ice cream and baby food. He then addressed the business challenges and objectives for implementing the Food Trust. At present, the Food Trust has more than 5 million blocks in its blockchain and is one of the largest non-crypto blockchain networks in the world. Also, regarding data ownership, uh, all Food Trust data is owned by the party that uploaded it. IBM owns nothing. Ultimately, IBM intends to build the Food Trust as a platform and for the food ecosystem to join it through additional primary and third party applications. Gopinath then addressed the global trade ecosystem. He said 80% of goods American consumers purchase spent at least some time on a container ship. Global supply chains involve many handoffs and tend to be paper based and document heavy. In these chains, data is trapped in silos, processes are time consuming, clearance is subject to delays, and operations are complex and costly. Blockchain can streamline these processes by providing all parties with trusted real-time information. Gopinath said that to get industry buy-in, like with the Food Trust, a blockchain solution needed to start with a, ledge, a large industry player. In March 2017, IBM and Maersk announced plans for the Trade Lens to accelerate supply chain digitization. Trials soon began, and by December 2018, IBM made trade lens available for any party to join for a fee. While the food trust and trade lens are evolving independently, Gopinath said that parties will be using both systems, requiring them to network together. Interoperability with other networks is therefore the next step in providing business value for blockchain technologies and commerce. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.36 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting to the social hour. Temperature, one degree C. Weather, snowy. Attendance in the Powell Auditorium, 66, and viewing through the live stream on the PSW Science YouTube channel, 25. Respectfully submitted, James Helam, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. Are there any comments or corrections to the minutes? Uh, hearing none, I will entertain a motion to accept the minutes as read. Do I have a second? All in favor? 
All opposed? Minutes are unanimously accepted and will be posted to the website in due course. We now turn to tonight's lecture on climate and cultural adaptation. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dagmar de Groot. Dagmar is professor of environmental history at Georgetown University and co-director of the Climate History Network. His work focuses on societal responses and adaptation to extreme environments and extreme environmental changes. He leads teams of scientists, historians, and archeologists in projects that trace the history of shifting hunting cultures in the Arctic and that unearth the resilience of diverse societies to pre-industrial climate changes. He co-founded and co-directs the Climate History Network and the widely accessed historicalclimatology.com website. His most recent publications focused on the historical relationships between climate change and conflict. His first book, The Frigid Golden Age, was named one of the 10 best history books of 2018 by the Financial Times. His second book, Civilization and the Cosmos, will explore how events in the solar system have engendered environmental changes on Earth that have influenced human history. Dagomar has appeared widely in the popular media, including CNN, Axios, Popular Science, and the Washington Post. He earned his BA and MA at McMaster University and his PhD at York University. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming Dagomar to the podium. so much, Larry, for that, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me here. Thank you all for coming here today. Um, I have to say that this is a lot of fun for me. It's fun for me to be here in such an opulent uh, building, um, but also fun for me to be out so late. Uh, I'm the father of a toddler, so this is kind of like a party to me, <laughs> especially uh, after my talk today. Um, so I'm pretty excited. Anyway, so Today, I'm going to introduce you to a very uh, unusual story, a story about a society that thrived in a period of climate change, and a climate change that was cooling, not warming, and one that happened about 400 years ago. It's very different from what we normally think about when we hear the words climate change. And it's an odd story made possible by a revolution and how we understand the past. Now, for about 100 years, climatologists of the past, paleoclimatologists, have scoured the globe for so-called climate proxy sources. And these are sources, which I'll call proxies from now on, that in some way register the influence of past climate change without directly recording it. The signature of past climate change is buried in their composition. And here you can see the scale of that effort. These are locations of proxy sources that have been accessed by scholars working for NOAA and the uh, National Climate Data Center, NCDC. And they are eight different kinds of climate proxy sources. Now, there are really dozens of these things, of these types of proxy sources. And here you can see in green, little green triangles, tree rings, and in little white triangles, ice cores. And you can see that they're exhumed from different parts of the globe, the tree rings mostly from the northern hemisphere, and the ice cores mostly from the ice sheets at the poles. I'm gonna go through these two proxy sources to give you a sense of of how paleoclimatologists use them. So first, tree rings. When trees grow, they add a layer of bark to the outside of the tree. And in outside of the tropics, trees have growing seasons and dormant seasons. During growing seasons, the cells, if you zoom into the tree trunk, the cells have 
are elongated and have thin walls. And then as you get to the end of a growing season, the walls thicken and the cells compress. And that's what accounts for these rings in the trees. It's the elongation of the cells early in a growing season and their compression late in that growing season. Now, some trees are highly sensitive to precipitation and others are highly sensitive to temperature. And that quality of, of, of the weather, either precipitation or temperature, will dictate how much they grow in a growing season, which means it will dictate how many of these elongated cells there are early in the growing season, and in turn, how wide the tree ring will be. And that means that if you know something about what the tree is sensitive to, you can actually use the thickness of tree rings to figure out how climate has changed over the lifespan of a tree. And trees live a long time, but you can actually take these records thousands of years into the past because you can also use dead trees. Could be fossilized trees, could even be trees used in buildings. You can actually find old buildings and exhume records of the wood that's been used in those buildings. So that's how we can use trees. We're called the, you can always think of the forest as a kind of natural archive. Right? We can use these trees in this natural archive to figure out how past climates have changed. So now, you might be familiar with tree rings. You probably have also heard of ice cores. Right? You drill cylinders into mountain glaciers, or better yet, into ice sheets, because you can really go far back in time in the ice sheets at the poles. And these ice cores, these cylinders that you exhume from the ice sheets, they have layers in them. The layers correspond to annual precipitation where the ice core has been exhumed. And not just of snow, but also of particulates in the atmosphere. When a big volcanic eruption blows up, often the dust from that eruption will end up in ice cores. So we can actually use ice cores to figure out the record of volcanic eruptions and even asteroid impacts on Earth. Now, that's precipitation, but if you measure the ratio of oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in layers in ice cores, you can also figure out temperature because precipitation at the pole is dictated in some way by the temperature of the Earth. So you can figure out temperature as well from these ice cores, and most interesting to me and probably most relevant to our future. Ice sheets and in turn ice cores have tiny little bubbles locked inside of them. And those bubbles contain ancient samples of the so-called paleo atmosphere. And we can actually test what the atmospheric composition was like on Earth going back as far down as we drill. And we can drill about three million years into the past when we look at ice cores. So that takes us a lot further into the past than the trees do. But really, what these kinds of sources have made possible is graphs like this one. This is a reconstruction of temperatures in the northern hemisphere in blue and in Europe and the Arctic in orange from the year 1000 until the year 2000 CE. The y-axis, as you can see there, uh, goes down to minus four and goes up to positive three. And zero, the average, that's the 20th century average. So the mid 20th century average. So what this shows, first of all, is anthropogenic global warming. Right? And really, if we brought this graph into 2019, it would look considerably more alarming. In fact, if you took a few steps back and squinted, it would start to look a little bit like a hockey stick. We've added about 0 0.5 degrees Celsius of warming since the end of this graph, since 2000. Now for me, a humble historian, what pops out is a period of climatic cooling that began midway through the 13th century and lasted arguably midway through the 19th century, maybe even up to the beginning of the 20th century. And this is a period that we call the Little Ice Age. Now, as you can see, this is not a period of constant cooling. There are warm periods and there are cold periods. 
even in the little ice age. But the coldest century of all is called, well, is the 17th century. It's bookended by two especially cold waves of the Little Ice Age that each have their own name. The Grindelwald fluctuation from the late 16th century through the early 17th century. And then the Maunder minimum from the mid to late 17th century to the early 18th century. There was modest warming, a couple decades of modest warming in some parts of the Northern Hemisphere that interrupts this really, really cold stretch of the Little Ice Age. Okay, this is another way of visualizing it, and this always <laughs> uh, terrifies my students when I show them slides like this one. So I'm gonna work through all of these images. At the top, you can see the same reconstruction now extending all the way back to 500 BCE. And the squiggly green line, that's actually a tree ring composite. So it shows you the uh, summer temperatures going back that far. And then the orange squiggly line is called a multi-proxy reconstruction. So it uses a whole bunch of different proxies to create this thing. Now there are also, I hope you can see it all the way at the back, but there are also little circles here, right? Little transparent circles. And that represents any of the 40 coldest years in this record. And then, I, I really doubt that you can see this, but kudos to you if you can, there are also little horizontal lines that represent any of the 12 coldest decades in this 2,500 year record. And what pops out again is the extraordinary cooling of the 17th century. Okay, so that's that top graph. Now we move to the one just below it where you can see a series of vertical lines. These vertical lines represent the scale, the extent, the magnitude of volcanic forcing. Forcing is a, a word often used by climatologists. It means something a little bit like influence, an influence on the climate system. And the longer the line, means the more aerosols, the more dust has been released by volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions have a really, or vo volcanoes in general, have a really complicated influence on the climate system. There's always carbon dioxide oozing from volcanic vents, about 200 million tons per year right now, which by the way, absolutely pales in comparison to how much CO2 human beings are releasing into the atmosphere. But also, if you have an explosive volcanic eruption, it can release huge clouds of sulfur dioxide into the upper stratosphere. Now sunlight and water, chemical reactions, change that sulfur dioxide into sulfur aerosols. In other words, dust. The dust scatters sunlight, which means that the stratosphere heats up and the surface of the Earth cools down. Stratosphere heats about three times more than the surface of the Earth cools down, but still the cooling can be very significant at the surface of the Earth for a big volcanic eruption. Now, there's a few other levels of complexity here. When the volcanic eruption happens in the northern hemisphere, well, those are the lines here you can see that are in blue. That means that all the dust from an from a vo explosive volcanic eruption stays in the northern hemisphere. When an eruption happens in the southern hemisphere, that's the dust will stay in the southern hemisphere. But if you get a big explosive volcanic eruption in the tropics, the dust will spread over the entire Earth. This is called a global volcanic dust veil. And so the cooling can be truly global in scope. Now with most volcanic eruptions, big volcanic eruptions, the acute cooling lasts only a couple years. If you get a cluster of really big volcanic eruptions, that can trigger so-called positive feedbacks in the climate system. Feedback is something that either amplifies or dampens the effect of climate, effect of forcing. And as you can imagine, climatologists are now extremely interested in feedback because that will very much determine our future in the coming century. But anyway, so what we see here is that big, uh, clusters of big volcanic eruptions coincide with every cold wave of the Little Ice Age. Especially, you can see them all clustered in the 13th century, and the 15th century, was, which was extremely cold, 
in the 17th century, the coldest of the Little Ice Age, and then in the 19th century. So that's what the top graph shows. It shows really that temperature is strongly tied to volcanic eruptions, at least the cooling. Now the bottom graph is from 2013, but it's one of my favorites. Um, it shows, I love graphs, <laughs> as you can probably tell. It shows a reconstruction again of temperatures in different regions now from the year zero to the year 2000. So you can see temperatures in the Arctic, Europe, Asia, North America, Australasia, South America, and finally the Antarctic. And this is a multi-proxy reconstruction, which means you find as many of these proxy sources as you can and combine them and throw them at the problem to create uh, visuals like this one. Of course, the warmer colors, redder it gets, the warmer it is, and the bluer it gets, the colder it is. And the first thing that pops out, at least to me, is that cold and warm periods do not affect every region at the same time, and they do not have the same magnitude in every region until really anthropogenic global warming. So again, if you extended this into the present, it would look considerably more depressing. But luckily for you, I haven't done that. <laughs> so now, thinking about the Little Ice Age, you can see five cold waves in the Little Ice Age, but really only three were global in scope. And those are those two cold waves that bookend the 17th century, the Grindelwald fluctuation again, and the Maunder minimum, and then the cold wave of the 19th century, which is called the Dalton minimum. So mostly global in scope, still some regional ver uh, variations. Now you'll also see, hopefully, for the people in the back, a little label here that says volcanic solar downturns. So we've talked about the volcanic stuff already, but also low points in solar activity, low points in solar output, coincide with each of these cold waves of the Little Ice Age. I think the pointer is working. Yes, I have not had cause to use it yet, but now I will. <laughs> so as you can see here with this fancy gadget, <laughs> uh, volcanic solar downturns. There we go. This is actually much harder to use. <laughs> and you can see these cold waves of the Little Ice Age right there. So they coincide with volcanic eruptions, but also in almost every case with a low point in solar output. Which one doesn't coincide with that? Low point in solar, in solar output, the Grindelwald fluctuation. Possibly the, whole, the coldest of the entire uh, Little Ice Age. However, low points in solar output called grand solar minima and volcanic eruptions probably account for much of the cooling of the Little Ice Age. So-called internal or chaotic forcing probably accounts for a lot as well, where the climate system, like any really complex system, undergoes variability and changes of its own accord. And a small change in solar insulation in the late summer of the Northern Hemisphere, insulation meaning just the amount of solar energy that reaches the Earth, because of a slight shifts in Earth's orbital characteristics, that probably accounts for a little bit too. And there's even a theory that, you might have seen this, that the depopulation of the Americas by European brutality and epidemic diseases also accounted actually for a small drop in atmospheric CO2, which may have contributed to the Grindelwald fluctuation, and I'm happy to talk about that during the Q&A. Okay. So now I will use this fancy thing to move forward. There we go. So this new understanding of our past in which climate fluctuates and in which we have really high resolution understanding, meaning high detail, high precision of understanding about those climatic fluctuations, it poses a challenge to historians. Chances are, if you've picked up a history book, you'll know that most historians tend to assume that people create their own history. It's human ideas, human actions that influence other ideas and other actions and thereby create human history. And in all of those accounts, nature is basically just a stage. It's a more or less static setting for human dramas. But what we now know is that nature is a restless actor. It changes all the time on very big scales 
but perhaps especially on a local and a regional scale, this kind of scale that mattered for people in the past. So now there's a kind of history, a branch of my profession called environmental history. And this kind of history basically looks at the past as though nature mattered. My colleague at Georgetown, John McNeil, defines environmental history as the mutual interactions, the study of the mutual interactions between people and nature through time. So that's what environmental history historians focus on. And there's a sizable, actually growing fast now, portion of environmental historians who call themselves climate historians. And climate historians work with scientists, first of all, to reconstruct past climate changes. Often we have documentary evidence of changes in weather that we can contribute, we can add them to multi-proxy reconstructions. And we figure out then how climatic fluctuations influence the histories of societies and communities. And even in some cases, how societies and communities influenced Earth's climate. This is a bit more debatable. And finally, we study cultural interpretations of climate. So how different cultures understand climates changing. Now, in recent years, there has been just a raft of books and articles about the Little Ice Age. So this is just an example of eight very recent books on the human history of the Little Ice Age. And all of them argue that climatic cooling caused crisis for societies and communities around the world. And the argument which is best articulated in Jeffrey Parker's Global Crisis, which I can now point to with this pointer, thusly, <laughs> this argument goes a little bit like this. Climatic cooling, first of all, influenced patterns of atmospheric and oceanic circulation and brought often precipitation extremes to one, from, to one region to another. And that ultimately, the cooling and the precipitation extremes, shortened or interrupted growing seasons. Now, farmers might have tr struggled to adjust, to adapt, but ultimately, shortened or interrupted growing seasons led to harvest failures in most societies. A harvest failures, if they went on long enough, overwhelmed the adaptive capacity of societies, uh, the depleted granaries, for example, and food price prices accordingly shot up. Food shortages often followed. When that happened, many people were malnourished, many people starved, lots of people died. Now, malnourished bodies have weaker immune systems than fully healthy bodies, which means that in society after society, the malnourished were prone to outbreaks of epidemic disease. So you've got starvation and outbreaks of epidemics. As a result, thousands, and in some cases, in some societies, millions of people moved from devastated countryside to cities. And as they did, as they migrated, as you can imagine, many were sick, many spread the disease even further. Now, in, amid all of this depopulation, naturally, people, suffering people blamed governments for their failure to provide relief. Revolts and rebellions often followed. And in many cases, protests that began over lack of food were redirected into existing sources of discontent, existing grievances with the state. When that happened, societies often fell apart in civil war. And when that happened, neighboring societies, in many cases, took advantage of the weakness of societies that seemed to be falling apart. According to Jeffrey Parker, for example, there were more revolts and rebellions globally in the 17th century than there were, there were ever before or after, this coldest century of the Little Ice Age. Now, warfare at the time especially drew enormous resources from the countryside. Not only that, but many armies in many parts of the world did not actually have good logistical chains, right? They actually had to plunder the countryside in order to obtain the food that they needed. So warfare, civil war or war between states actually compounded all of the problems that climate change was causing, outbreaks of epidemic disease were causing. 
and many rural areas were left devoid of people, which of course made it then much harder to grow food. So all of these problems were connected in complicated ways. And this is what Jeffrey Parker called a fatal synergy between climate change, starvation, epidemic disease, and, and warfare. So that's the argument that Jeffrey Parker really, I think, does best, but that many different scholars, climate historians, have made. And a big focus of my work over the past, a little over a decade now, have been to find examples of societies that seem to be exceptions, communities that seem to be exceptions, to try and identify which people, in the face of all of this crisis and disaster, seem to thrive. It's my opinion that examples from the past of communities and societies that thrived in the face of climate change are especially, can be at least, especially useful for us today. So that passion naturally took me to the Dutch Republic because there is no society that thrived more in the 17th century than the Dutch Republic. You can see a map here of the Republic in 1609 and a map of Amsterdam in the 16th century. You can see that the Dutch Republic is essentially the precursor state of the present day Netherlands, which happened to be where I was born, so I had at least the Dutch language already. That was definitely very helpful. <laughs> but the Dutch Republic actually enjoyed what's still remembered now as a golden age during the 17th century, when its population almost doubled, its economy thrived, and in fact, the Dutch developed world-straddling networks of trade and were uh, the essential players in the early globalization of the world. Industry boomed, urbanization reached almost unimaginable levels for the time, about 40% in the major province of Holland, which contained 60% of the Republic's population. 40% doesn't sound like that much now, but most societies didn't reach that number. Even Western developed societies didn't reach that number until the 20th century. Right. And so this is a, a, a booming society. And in fact, per capita wealth in the Republic was higher than it was anywhere else in the world in the 17th century. So my question as I approached this topic was, is the Little Ice Age just not hitting this part of the world? Is it just, you know, I showed you those regional variations, right? Is it just not that cold? Right? Or is there something about the Dutch that helped them thrive, that helped them prosper uh, more than other societies do? And so I quickly found and worked with people to develop climate reconstructions, temperature, and precipitation in the Dutch Republic. And this shows you seasonal averages of winter, summer, spring, and fall from the year 700 until the year 2000 in the Low Countries. The Dutch Republic is part of the Low Countries. And as you can see, it got sharply colder in just about every season during the three cold waves of the Little Ice Age that coincided with the lifespan of the Republic the uh, Grindelwald fluctuation, the Maunder minimum, and the Dalton minimum. So it got a lot colder. But also I discovered that the weather became less predictable from year to year. So it became more variable in each of these cold waves. And storms seemed to have increased in severity, and probably also in quantity, again, during each of these cold waves. Because of the more intense, and more frequent storms, precipitation also went up in the Grindelwald fluctuation and the Maunder minimum at least. Which means that really, if you think purely in environmental terms, the low countries are not a good place to be during the Little Ice Age. They were strongly affected by the cooling trends of the period. So in uh, my book, The Frigid Golden Age and Since, I thought about this and come up with four ways, really, in which the Dutch were able to prosper during the Little Ice Age. First, global climatic trends altered local and regional environments in ways that broadly benefited Dutch ways of conducting commerce or waging war. And I call this positive impacts. There's probably a better term for it that I haven't come across yet. 
Second, otherwise destructive weather didn't cause as much damage in the Dutch Republic. And I argue that this is because the Dutch were resilient in the face of this otherwise devastating weather. And resilience really means you either take less damage or you bounce back more quickly. You probably heard this term of climate resilience used a lot in recent years. Second, the Dutch seem to have been adaptive. And I argue that you don't need to know about climatic trends in order to adapt to weather events that those trends make more likely. So it's not like the Dutch realized that they were living in a little ice age necessarily, but they did adapt their technologies, their practices to not only cope with, but actually exploit the weather of the little ice age. And finally, the Dutch seem to have been ruthlessly opportunistic, brutally exploiting the weaknesses of societies that were often weakened by the cooling of the Little Ice Age, not only in Europe, but globally, on a pretty gigantic scale. Now, one of the lessons from my work is that all of this stuff is really complicated. And although the Little Ice Age had broadly beneficial impacts on the Dutch Republic, the Dutch also suffered in many different ways. So it's, it's overall, there's more benefits, but there's also a lot of drawbacks. For one, the rivers that screened the Republic from invasion when they were actually liquid froze over during very cold winters. And repeatedly, armies were able to use those rivers as sort of highways into the Dutch Republic. This happened many times in the late 16th century when Spanish armies invaded, and then in the late 17th century when a French army invaded as well. And it also happened in the late 18th century. Here's a Napoleonic army crossing into the Republic. Now, this is not really from the time period that I focus on, but it's the best picture I could find. Now, perhaps even worse, or argu arguably worse, when cooling was fast, and really severe, Dutch ships could be frozen, trapped by ice before they reached uh, port. And that could mean either that vital commodities could not reach port cities, or that warships could not be used um, to defend the Republic from naval fleets. In both cases, not a very good situation to be in. So the Dutch struggled to adapt. If the ice was thin enough, they tried to cut their ships loose, uh, literally tried to hack through the ice. And of course, if the ice was thick enough, if it thickened really fast, they couldn't do that. And as you can see in this illustration, they also tried to drag essential commodities from ships into port over the ice using sleighs. But that wasn't always very effective either, and often it could be extremely dangerous. So sometimes essential imports of grain, for example, could literally be frozen at sea. There are also anecdotal reports, which I take with a couple of grains of salt, of people literally freezing to death as they try to get from point A to point B in the Dutch Republic. And there are reports, too, of families freezing in poorly insulated homes. So it's hard to know how seriously to take this. There's no quantitative data that I can use. But it is worth mentioning. And we even have paintings of people struggling through ice and snow from this period. More consequential, arguably, than any of this stuff is what happened to what the Dutch called the Mutter Negosi, the mother of all trades, which involved Dutch merchants purchasing bulk commodities in the Baltic, mostly grain and wood, in exchange for a low volume, high value goods from Southern Europe, textiles, for example, um, or wine. And this actually accounted for a vital portion of the Dutch diet, grain imported from the Baltic. Now, all ships that passed into the Baltic had to pass by the toll house of Elsinore, which you can see right here. It's right beside this giant castle, which had cannons and it forced ships passing through to pay dues at this toll house. It became a major source of revenue for the Danish crown. And so I used revenues paid by ships to figure out 
changes in the flow of Dutch ships into the Baltic during winter. And it turns out that there's a statistically significant correlation between winter temperature and the flow of ships into the Baltic. And why? Because in cold winters, there was just too much sea ice. You couldn't get into the Baltic if you were trying to sail in. Warm winters, by contrast, you could just enter freely. And this is really important, of course, because not only is this trade very lucrative for Dutch merchants, but in many cases, food prices could go up if grain ships didn't arrive in the Dutch Republic. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, merchants struggled to find a quicker way to Asia during precisely the coldest stretch of the Little Ice Age. And cartographers had actually calculated that going through the Arctic would be much faster than going around Africa or around South America, which is absolutely true, except, of course, the Arctic was choked with ice. And so we have many uh, depictions of Arctic explorers dying on her heroically, as you can see, on ice flows, uh, having failed to reach their destinations. More consequentially, perhaps, in the high medieval centuries, the Dutch, Dutch settlers really had drained peat bogs and started pastoral economies on the peat. So they're actually pushing the peat down. And as they did that, the land of what would become the Dutch Republic started sinking. And it eventually sank about two meters in some parts of the coastal provinces of the Dutch Republic below sea level. And at first, small communities and ultimately larger governments constructed networked dikes and dams and sluices to defend the coastal provinces from what they called the water wolf, the sea. Now this worked quite well if the dams and dikes were properly maintained, but often they weren't. And so when a severe storm, one of these little ice age storms blew into the Republic, repeatedly dikes and dams gave way. And in, many, in some cases, thousands of people died. You can see another illustration of one of these floods, this one from the 17th century. And not only, of course, do people die, but animals die too. And salty water can make soil very difficult to farm on for years. So this is really destructive when these inundations happen. Not only that, but after bitterly cold winter, ice in huge quantities could melt very quickly and find choke points in rivers, congregating into what the Dutch called ice dams. Now, farmland around riverbanks had also, in many cases, sunk very low. So the actual land around rivers was below the, rev the level of the banks of the rivers. So these ice dams threatened enormous amounts of flooding as water sort of welled up behind the dam. And here you can see someone aghast. There we go. Standing aghast at the horror happening in front of him. So these river inundations, these river floods happened repeatedly during the golden age of the Dutch Republic. So things were not all good. And in fact, I also graphed just about every Dutch East India Company journey. The Dutch East India Company was the wealthiest and most powerful company maybe ever and certainly of the 17th century. And there's these remarkable archives that are preserved of Dutch East India Company operations. So I graphed mortality, the number of deaths during Dutch East India Company voyages, and I found that mortality spiked during particularly stormy years of the Little Ice Age in the northeastern Atlantic. And it's often in the northeastern Atlantic that storms made ships go down during the Little Ice Age. So there's, there's a relationship that seems to be there. And we have these remarkable scenes of ships tossed about by storms from the Dutch Golden Age. Not all actually show real storms and real ships. In fact, most of them probably don't. But they do reflect real anxieties, I think, that were highly justified during the Little Ice Age. OK, so things are not always great, <laughs> to say the least. But now I want to get into some of these ways that the Dutch actually benefited from climatic cooling. And I have many examples in my work, in my book, but probably the most vivid come from the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 17th century, 
primarily naval wars that coincided with the onset of the Maunder Minimum, this beginning of this cold wave of the Little Ice Age. Now, when climates cooled, circulation and pressure patterns in the atmosphere responded. And in fact, in some cases, also helped bring cooling to different regions. And the one that matters most for this story is called the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO. It consists of a low pressure zone around Iceland and a high pressure zone around the Azores. And when the difference between the low pressure and the high pressure isn't that great, we say that the NAO is in a negative setting. But when that difference is really strong, when the low pressure is really low and the high pressure is really high, we say the NAO is in a positive setting or phase. And what that means is pretty profound for Europe and really for much of Eurasia. When the NAO is in a negative setting, winds from the west, westerly winds, tend to meander and they kind of flow further south into the Mediterranean. But when the NAO is in a positive setting, westerly winds are funneled into northern Europe, which means, ultimately, that easterly winds are more common in northern Europe in a negative NAO and less common in a positive NAO. Let me show you another graph. So this is a graph of the setting of the NAO during the 17th century. And here, I have depicted in a very fancy way the three Anglo-Dutch wars of the 17th century. You can see that the first Anglo-Dutch war coincides with a positive NAO, and the second and third, a negative NAO, associated, we now know, with the onset of the Maunder Minimum. I've also graphed records of wind direction reported in logbooks kept aboard ships, in intelligence reports, in internal correspondence within navies. And it all showed me that during battles, naval battles during the Anglo-Dutch Wars, westerly winds were more common in the first war and became very rare, actually, in the second and third wars. Easterly winds, winds from the east, became more common. Now, who cares, right? <laughs> You'd be justified at this point in asking, who cares about the NAO and these wind patterns? Well, you have to think at the time, the technology of ships depended powerfully on the wind. The wind patterns not only determined how fast you could go, but also where you could go. This is the age of sail, after all. And what you wanted as a naval commander was to acquire the so-called weather gauge, which meant that you would be between the origin of the wind and your enemy. So let me illustrate that in this beautiful painting, if you ask me, from the first Anglo-Dutch War. So in this painting, the wind is blowing from left to right. You can see that with the flags that are waving on these ships, which means that the English flagship in the middle of the painting would be on the lee, would have the lee position, and the Dutch flagship would have the weather position, meaning it would have the weather gauge. Having the weather gauge allowed you to, to determine when and how to attack and when and how to retreat. And it was particularly important when you think about how naval wars were actually fought at the time. During the Anglo-Dutch Wars, English and then Dutch commanders and admirals refined so-called line-of-battle tactics, where you sailed at each other in single file, and then you turned and you did it again, and again, and again, all the while trying to remain just the right distance from your enemy, so you could bombard your enemy, until the enemy's lines broke. So that required, again, keeping that proper distance from the enemy, being able to turn, and also, in many cases, being able to retreat when you wanted to. And all that depended on having the weather gauge. All of it depended on the wind. Now, this is a map of battles during the first Anglo-Dutch War. Every circle is a battle. And the flag in that circle represents which side won the battle. The cross for England and the tricolor for the Dutch Republic. I've also added arrows 
the arrows represent which way the wind was blowing. The thicker the arrow, the harder the wind was blowing. Here you can see that, first of all, the English won most of the battles, and second of all, that the wind was almost always blowing from the west. And if you think about where fleets would sail from, right, English fleets were almost always sailing from the west, which means that if the wind is from the west, they almost always have the weather gauge. Now flip to the second and third Anglo-Dutch wars. Right, now the wind is almost always blowing from the east. And now, as you can see, the Dutch win most of the battles. And this, these relationships extended far beyond the sea. And I'll just give you one example. In the city of London, this is what it looked like in the middle of the 17th century. In 1666, towards the end of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, a fire broke out in Pudding Lane, right here. At the same time, a driving easterly wind was affecting naval operations actually between the Dutch and the English. But it pushed the fire into the downtown core of London, where it incinerated almost the entire city, killed many, many people, cost an enormous amount to restore. And in fact, the next year, the English couldn't even field a fleet, partly on account of this fire. Now, all of this was very significant because victory in the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars ultimately saved the Republic, likely from extinction, and certainly preserved its naval primacy. And a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it, can be tied to these profound environmental changes in the North Sea region. My favorite topic, really, from the book is probably adaptation. And partly because it lets me talk about all kinds of bizarre, in some cases, technological adaptations to shifting environments. Again, when the Grindelwald fluctuation started cooling the northern hemisphere in the late 16th century, sea surface temperatures also cooled. And that meant that many animals migrated, including the great herring schools of the Baltic Sea. They actually migrated from the Baltic into the North Sea, where they were closer to the Dutch Republic. As that was happening, Dutch shipwrights designed a technology that they called the herring bus. Dutch is not necessarily the most beautiful language. <laughs> it's a kind of a factory ship where you could salt fish at sea. And what that meant was that you didn't have to go back to port every time you had caught some fish. You could stay out at sea much longer, and uh, you could ultimately catch a lot more fish. So this is an adaptation to the proximity of herring schools. And herring became a very important part of the Dutch diet and a fairly important part of the Dutch economy. Here are two uh, adaptations that I like a little bit more, actually. At the top, you can see the so-called ice wagon. It's basically a mix between a boat and an actual wagon. You strap a sail onto an elongated wagon, and this thing could travel up to 80 kilometers an hour, apparently, on the ice, which for at the time was absolutely extraordinary. Now, not too many of these things were built, but the fact that people were even inventing these kinds of technologies that were attuned, that were suited for the ice, shows them thinking about how to adapt to changing weather conditions. At the bottom, Right here, you can see an ice breaker. This is a 17th and 18th century ice breaker. What it is is basically a barge pulled often by a team of horses. The thicker the ice, the more horses. And there are actually iron, iron plates here at the bow of the ship. The ice is forced under the ship but it's also broken up in such a way that it comes out as neat sort of blocks at the stern of the ship. The blocks could then be sold for use in cellars. So they're literally exploiting a cooler climate. And this was a very important technology, often funded by breweries, um, brewers guilds, in order to keep open vital lines of communication that were essential for, for example, bringing fresh water into Amsterdam. So they're coping with and also exploiting a cooling climate. Another example is kind of uh, counterintuitive at first, but it concerns putting out fires. After the Great Fire of London in 1666, 
or actually a raft of other urban fires across Europe, many of which were started by severe storms. And in response, a Dutch inventor, Jan van der Heyden, develops what are really modern firefighting techniques, fire hoses, mobile fire engines, and standing fire brigades. And this is an illustration here not only of an urban fire being started by a storm, but also of all of these new Dutch technologies at work in stopping and putting out a fire. Here you can see again these fire hoses at work in putting out fires. Van der Heyden developed a company and ultimately exported his inventions across Europe, of course, in the finest Dutch tradition for lucrative profits. So again, exploiting changing environmental circumstances. Adaptations could also be entirely cultural. During very cold winters, Dutch people of all social classes would gather on the ice, it had a social leveling effect. But merchants were drawn to these kinds of gatherings and often set up stalls to hawk their goods. Thousands of people, in many cases, would travel from very far afield to shop at these ice carnivals. So again, merchants exploiting new opportunities avoided by different environmental changes, but also people interacting with each other in different, uh, in different ways. And we've got a lot of paintings like this uh, from the Little Ice Age in the Dutch Republic. Now my favorite example of adaptation comes to us from the Arctic. And this is something I've been writing about a lot in the last year or so. In the early 17th century, rival whalers, so midway through the Grindelwald fluctuation, rival whalers set up a thriving whaling industry called the Greenland fishery between the archipelago of Svalbard and the island of Jan Mayanen. They were hunting what was then about 55,000 bowhead whales, some of the biggest whales you can find, really, really thick blubber that they would boil into oil. The whales in the spring would enter the bays of Spitsbergen, which is the biggest island in the Svalbard archipelago right here. They would enter these bays. And whalers would pursue them from temporary encampments. This is a, a late 17th century painting, but a depiction of how whaling was done earlier in the 17th century. They would kill a whale, the whale would float on the water, they would flense it, meaning strip away the blubber, transport the blubber, to furnaces on the coast, boil it there, into barrels, back in the ship, then go back to their home ports. This is, of course, as you can imagine, a very brutal industry. Now, in the Maunder minimum, something happens to the environment of Svalbard. It gets a lot colder even than it was in the Grindelwald fluctuation. And sea ice starts to choke all of these bays that could previously be used. So old whale, uh, ways of whaling could no longer be used at all. However, at the same time, the number of whales killed, tragically, spikes during the modern minimum, and the number of ships that set sail also rises, Dutch ships, that is. And in fact, the Dutch start to dominate the whaling industry in the modern minimum. So how? Well, Dutch shipwrecks, shipwrights, thickened the hulls of whaling ships. They greased them so the ships would slide off the ice, and they developed ways of actually cooking whale blubber aboard ships, which was very, very dangerous, as you can imagine. You don't want fire anywhere near wooden ships. So they eventually learned to actually transport the blubber intact from the Arctic and back to the Dutch Republic. And all of this whaling they just did at sea. They no longer used uh, bays at all. So a complete transformation in the culture, the practice, and the technology of whaling in the Arctic. I don't have too much time left, so I'm going to quickly go through just two examples of resilience. And the best one, I think, concerns the transportation network of the Dutch Republic. There were just so many ways of getting from point A to point B, at least in the densely populated coastal provinces of the Republic. And for a commercial economy, for what's even been called a capitalist economy, it's very important to transport people and especially information 
between centers of population. So here you can see this is an 18th century depiction, actually. In the winter, you can travel by skate or by sled between population centers. The skate is actually a Dutch invention as well. And in the, su in the summer, you can go by road. And in the background, you can actually see a network of artificial canals that were constructed between population centers. And these canals were not just trafficked by ships with sails, but something that the Dutch called pole ferries, trekvart. And these are barges that are pulled by horses walking along the side of the canal. And that was really significant. This network was built during the Grindelwald fluctuation, and it allowed travelers to depart at set times and arrive at set times because pole ferries were not dependent on the wind, unlike sailing ships. So in any weather, except when it was freezing, you could get easily on set times, scheduled times from point A to point B in the Dutch Republic. And this is a depiction of the Dutch transportation system around 1700. So you can see the complexity of this thing and how many different ways you can get from one point to another. And this just meant that even if weather, if weather condition, a storm like the one we had today overwhelms one road, you could still use another or use a canal, anything. Another good example of resilience involves the Dutch diet. So in much of the world right now, or at this time, I should say, we didn't spend too much time in the 17th century, in much, <laughs> in much of the world, people relied on just one staple crop. Rye, for example, is extremely common throughout Europe. But the Dutch relied on a diverse diet, fish, dairy products, wheat, rye, some of which was imported from diverse locations that it's very rare that they were all hit by the same weather event. This still life here is maybe a semi-fanciful depiction of someone's supper, but still gives you an impression of how important seafood was to the Dutch. And seafood and dairy, all these things were just not affected in the same way by the same kinds of weather. So the system of food as well was much more resilient than the food system elsewhere. Also, it was often the poor who suffered most in the face of food shortages and increases in food prices across Europe and the wider world. But many Dutch cities had very strong and proud traditions of civic charity during the 17th century, which means that they regularly handed out food to the very poor. And this insulated the poorest people in the coastal cities of the Dutch Republic from the kind of food shortages that affected the rest of the early modern of the Little Ice Age world. One quick note on opportunism, because I'm definitely running out of time. This is a graph of rye prices in Amsterdam from 1560 all the way through the early 19th century. And here in black, I've highlighted especially cold years. And you can see that cold years almost always coincided with high rye prices. Now, the Amsterdam market was special in the 17th century. It was really the clearinghouse for the rest of Europe. Everything sort of traveled through Amsterdam. And that's what partially makes that reconstruction a reconstruction for European prices. Now, before I mentioned the mother of all trades, the Munner Negosi, a very essential part of that trade was grain. And Dutch merchants would actually stockpile grains in enormous quantities in warehouses in Amsterdam and to a lesser extent Rotterdam, which meant, of course, that when food shortages affected other parts of Europe, the Dutch had these enormous stockpiles of grain that they could sell often at high prices. Right? So exploiting in a pretty direct way the misfortune of others. Okay, so just some conclusions here. First, creative responses to climate change do not account for the whole golden age of the Dutch Republic, but they're an overlooked part of it. And if we can find that with the Dutch story, we can find that in many other national or local histories as well. The influence of environmental change has been overlooked in the story of different places and peoples. 
And it's through resilience, adaptation, positive impacts, and opportunism that the Dutch managed to thrive. I think really what this kind of work shows is that ultimately people in the past were not just passive victims in the face of climate change, which is, in my opinion, often how they're depicted by climate historians. In the climate pools, for example, everybody suffers. Well, really, we can see them responding in creative ways, intelligent ways, um, to big environmental changes. And in many cases, there were both winners and losers on many, many different scales. Now, there's a limit to how much stories like this can tell us about our future. Many of you will probably have seen graphs like these. The top one is an ice core, a reconstruction of atmospheric CO2 concentrations over the past 400,000 years, which is roughly uh, as old as our species is. Our species is about 300,000 years old. And you can see, right now we're at 414 parts per million, no historical parallel at all. And at the bottom, you can see a reconstruction of average annual global temperatures from 1880s, so that's around the end of the Little Ice Age, through 2016 in this case. You can just see the magnitude of warming, and just since 2000, we've had 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. The world that we are heading towards could well look like this. So this is the Earth in a moderate emission scenario. And you can see the sheer scale of warming here. This goes all the way to beyond 8 degrees Celsius of warming. And often when we think about global warming on the scale of 2, 3 degrees Celsius, we don't realize that it's spatially different, right? The Arctic is going to warm much, much more than the rest of the world. And it's in the Arctic where we have all these positive feedbacks. We have the ice that's melting and will affect our coastal areas. The upshot is that there are limits to how much a society, a community can adapt to climate change, right? And we have to work above and beyond all else on avoiding this future for our children. All right, that's all I got. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions, and uh, we have a procedure for taking questions. We have people with microphones. I think we have a red microphone and a black microphone. So if you have a question, you should raise your hand. When the microphone comes to you, please stand. Please tell us your name. Please tell us if you are or are not a member, and ask a question. Save speeches <laughs> and dialogue for the social hour. <laughs> The microphones will be on. Please stand. Carl, why don't you start? Hi, Carl Merrill. I'm a, I'm a member. Um, so I have a, a question. In that, I mean, I, I'd like you to make a comment uh, on two things. One is that the Dutch had tremendous political influence on the rest of the world. I mean, they took over Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing is they had tremendous scientific mm. effects. They invented the microscope, which led to a total industrial, in total scientific revolution. Could you comment on those a little? Sure. Well, actually, um, the issue of the Dutch taking over Britain in the glorious revolution of 1688. William of Orange. On exactly. William III. Yeah. Um, that's actually part of this story. And you might have heard of the Protestant wind, right? And this is a driving easterly wind. Uh, that facilitated that invasion. So a little bit of background. The invasion fleet was four times bigger than the Spanish arm armada. To give you a sense of, I mean, we don't really talk about this, but it's that, that big. And the invasion was launched because there were rumors, and really this is true, that the English were allying with France. France was Catholic at the time. The king of England, there were rumors that he was Catholic. Well, he was Catholic. And... Uh, what the Dutch did not want, the Protestant states of Europe did not want, was an alliance between the two. And so William III decided to invade England. His invasion fleet was only ready in October. This is a really, really stormy season, even now, especially then. 
And so nobody really, in England anyway, really took it seriously that he would actually be crazy enough to try and invade England in October. And he did attempt it, and sure enough, a storm hit his fleet just as it left port, scattered it. They managed to reconstitute the fleet, and at that, just that moment as they had reconstituted it, a driving easterly wind, which thanks to research partly conducted by a student of mine, we now know was common in this year, this driving easterly wind pushes his whole fleet so fast to England that the English fleet can't engage, especially in the easterly winds, right? They literally can't sail out to meet it. So this too, I think, we can link to the Monger Minimum and the Little Ice Age. Now, the Glorious Revolution, it's called a revolution because of Dutch propaganda. Right? So they wanted to convince people um, that this was an indigenous uprising against the corrupt king. Um, and they successfully did that. It's one of history's more successful propaganda attempts. But it ultimately was disastrous for the Dutch Republic because the center of Dutch politics and ultimately of Dutch wealth moved from the Dutch Republic to England. William III uh, uh, set up his court in England. And all those Dutch technologies and Dutch best practices moved with him as well. So England almost became a big Dutch Republic. Um, and there's actually a book by Lisa Jardine called Going Dutch, which describes this process. Um, so this was really the beginning of the end. The success, the biggest success, maybe in, in this period for the Dutch, became their downfall. And then in terms of technology and, and science, really, it's for a while I've been looking, or I was looking, kind of abandoned the attempt, for um, a connection with science to parts of this story. And there were some interesting examples of Dutch scientists developing proto-meteorological networks. But what I couldn't do is connect that to their understanding that weather seemed to be changing. You can see some of that actually in England. Uh, Francis Bacon, for example, calls for the development of meteorological networks to predict changes in winds for naval battles. But I couldn't find those kinds of smoking guns in the Dutch Republic, so I, I left it out of my story. Maybe I should do a bit more research for the second edition, I don't know. But, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot to think and talk the about. young lady in red, and then the black, and then the blue. Good evening. My name is Svetlana Rehova Tibitz. I have a PhD from the Moscow State University. I'm a member of the National Press Club. And I have a question. For example, the Holland people uh, in 1650, they built in uh, Orange Fort. Now it is Albany, mm. the, the capital of the United States. They built a church. The microphone up so we uh, they build a church. And they used the special windows, color windows. And they dated 1656. Mm. I have one of them. And, uh, but the design was made in Holland. Uh, but they made in Orange Fort. Mm. What communication was through the ocean? Or, or how did they communicate? Because it takes time. And um, why Holland people, they left this area? Mm. Because they were in Albany. Uh, Orange Fort, they were in New York City. Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, Thank you. sure. Repeat the question. So the question is, how did these networks of communication really work between the Dutch Republic and uh, New Amsterdam, right? Which was what it was then called. Orange New Fort, Fort, Fort. Uh, Fort Orange in particular, yeah. And then secondly, why, you know, why did the Dutch give up on the New Netherlands and New Amsterdam? So I'm going to do my best to answer those questions. So number one, in terms of networks of communication, traveled by ship, of course, right? Um, in terms of that particular technology, I have no idea. No idea. But any sort of transportation would have happened by ship, maybe also influenced by climate change because of shifting patterns of atmospheric circulation. Although that's kind of hard to do in one particular case. The second question I can answer a whole lot better, and that's because at the end of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, which the Dutch won, there had to be a peace treaty that allowed the English to save face. So the Dutch figured, we will give up these useless territories of the New Netherlands, which uh, produced very little wealth, 
in exchange for the English giving us Suriname, which was much more further to the south, and they thought they could use for sugar cultivation, which was then a big, big industry. So that's what they decided to do. So they gave up the New Netherlands. Turns out it wasn't that useless after all. But <laughs> at the time, it made good sense, and it was a way of placating the English. So at least the second question I can answer a little bit better than the first. Thank you. I'm Colin Alberts. I'm a member. Um, I have a question about another part of the world, which is indirectly, but I think probably does have a connection with the Dutch Republic. Mm. Uh, you did talk about North Atlantic oscillations, but I wonder, has much work been done uh, exploring the effect of the Little Ice Age on uh, uh, thermohaline gyres in the North Pacific? Because mm. it seems to me the most important trade route of that century was actually were the Manila galleons that allowed the Spanish to take uh, Mexican silver and, from Acapulco and shoot it over uh, across the Pacific Ocean. Now, mm -hmm. with that, it had huge effects. I mean, obviously, on Mexico, it uh, remonetized the Chinese economy, uh, a whole bunch of effects. But the effect in Europe was that Spain, and by extension, Italy, and most of the Mediterranean basin still had its economy based on precious metals. Mm -hmm. and. I'm just wondering, has any you know, thought been given to that in terms of like how, whether that was sort of the spur to make the Dutch have an economy based more on finance and speculation and uh, more financial innovation? So first of all, in terms of those trade networks, um, the Manila uh, Galleons, there's actually a study that's come out just a couple years ago that attempts to reconstruct how these journeys were influenced by changes in atmospheric circulation. And I'm, I don't remember what the conclusion was exactly, but there does seem to have been a link between the climatic fluctuations of the Little Ice Age and the speed and success of these, rates of success of these journeys. So you can actually look that up. They're, it's a pioneering study, really. Um, in terms of the importance of, you know, the trade of Spanish silver on the Dutch economy, um, of course, it was incredibly important. Um, and the Spanish were really what the Dutch were trying to emulate, at least in the, in the late 16th century. They wanted the success that they could see the Spanish having. And as a result, they worked very hard to displace the Spanish and the Portuguese, because the Portuguese and Spanish crowns were united for part of the late 16th and early 17th century displaced the Spanish and Portuguese wherever they could find them. So in Asia, for a while, in South America and Central America as well. So they were trying to capture some of that success. And of course, the Spanish economy ultimately suffered because of its reliance on precious metals. Um, but the uh, Dutch Republic never achieved, or achieved, <laughs> never descended into that kind of reliance in the same economic sector. Yeah. So we're going to have blue, and then red, and then black. So our next question is from the live stream. Uh, one of our members, Bob Terry, uh, was watching tonight from Columbia, Maryland. And you mentioned earlier about how um, the deaths of the indigenous peoples of North America contributed to the Little Ice Age. Um, and so he wanted you to expand on that. OK. So in 2003, uh, paleoclimatologist William Ruddeman argued that changes in population could be tied to periods of climatic cooling. And how, when a lot of people died, we're talking about the Black Death, for example, then fields and woodlands could no longer be cultivated, which meant they basically went wild. And all these new wild plants and what used to be you know, agricultural monocultures, right, fields, um, sucked up so much CO2 out of the atmosphere that they actually contributed to a slight decline in atmospheric CO2 levels and thereby modest cooling. Now, the argument doesn't really work for most periods of depopulation, but now a new study, and really there's been a few of these studies, but this new study is really comprehensive, by uh, last name Koch et al., argues that really puts some numbers on these, this relationship and focuses on the depopulation of the Americas with the coming 
be beginning with the coming of Columbus in 1492. And this depends a lot on population statistics. So it now seems that about 60 million people lived in the Americas, in the New World, in 1492. And maybe 50 million people had died by the 17th century for a whole host of reasons, partially virgin soil epidemics, so epidemics that had never made it to the Americas before the um, flooding of Beringia now arrived at the same time. Smallpox, plague, measles, the list goes on. Right? And you know, people died in enormous quantities. Nobody had any immunity or resistance to these new diseases. But also, um, the Spanish killed enormous numbers of people and forced huge numbers of people into grueling forced labor for silver, for example, for gold, or forced them off of the, their environments that they used to use, or imported animals in huge quantities that chewed through those environments. So there's enormous death toll. Now when this happened, the argument goes, at the tropics, the tropical forests right, are enormously good carbon sinks, much better than many European forests. So this is a bit of an average, but for the most part. So tropical forests and tropical foliage overran what used to be cultivated fields and woodlands and pulled as much as seven parts per million of atmospheric CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the argument is that that contributed to the Grindelwald fluctuation, which may have been the coldest phase of the Little Ice Age. How much? Maybe accounts for half of the cooling during the Grindelwald fluctuation. So this is a, a compelling argument in part because I mentioned earlier that solar activity doesn't fall during the Grindelwald fluctuation. And volcanic eruptions, really the first big one is in 1595, and then another one in 1600. But there's not much before that, and the cooling really affects most of the northern hemisphere anyway, beginning in around 1560. So what accounts for that earlier cooling? Now this theory, if you ask me, and I've written a little bit about this at my website, historicalclimatology.com, and done some interviews about it, it doesn't really hold weight for a number, or rather, I shouldn't say that, it's, it's not as certain as the co-authors seem to suggest that it is, and certainly that media reports seem to suggest it is. And the reason for that, well, there's a few. Number one, some ice cores show a gradual decline in CO2 over the course of the 16th century. Others show a rapid fall in 1590. And that difference has to be reconciled somehow. It may have a lot to do with local conditions where ice cores have been exhumed, which can account for small, little variability uh, in atmospheric CO2, which you find out through ice cores. So that's one problem. But a much bigger problem has to do with our data for land use in the 16th century, which really relies on population and land use models, three different models, really. And those models differ radically from each other. So again, there's that problem. And finally, even as the Americas are being depopulated in the 16th century, the population of the world is actually growing by as much as 100 million, which is one thing that makes many empires, many societies vulnerable to climatic cooling. Simply too many people, too many farmers on marginal land. So that suggests actually that far from reforestation happening, deforestation might be happening in the 16th century. And if you want to find out much, much more about this, I did write that article a few weeks ago at Historical Climatology. Dot com. But anyway, so it's a cool idea, but I have some objections to it. Great microphone. William Angel, not a member. Um, your talk has been a phenomenal um, example of how historical climate data can inform history and provide insight there. Could you talk a little bit about how history, and specifically historical documents, mm. can help provide insight into the climate science and specifically the climate data? I'd love to, yeah. Thank you. Where's Axa? <laughs> um, yeah, I would love to. So historical documents contain two different things that are useful for us. One can be direct observations, direct measurements of weather. So let's think about the ships again. Ship logbooks started being kept by European mariners in the 16th century as mariners started to tail, sail further from the shore. And when that happened, they had to take into account wind direction and velocity. 
So they were able to calculate a latitude with some accuracy, but not longitude. Right? So they used a technique called dead reckoning, where you sort of calculate your course. And part of those calculations had to involve the wind, because the wind always sort of pushed you from where you wanted to go. So they're always taking note of the wind. So we have these logbooks, thousands and thousands of them, that tell us about wind direction and velocity, usually in parts of the Earth that we can be pretty sure about, and usually with a high degree of reliability because people depended on keeping accurate measurements. So we can use these logbooks, and it's been done partly by me, to reconstruct changes in atmospheric circulation, which can be difficult to access using proxy data. You can do something that's called model hindcasting, where instead of um, forecasting the future, you use climate models um, to actually hindcast the past. You start at, say, the year 1000 and move forward. Um, and that gives us a sense of circulation. But these kinds of documents are really useful for filling in the blanks and also for testing the proxy-based reconstructions and the model hindcasts. So that is very useful. And secondly, we can use documents to get a handle on activities that must have been influenced by weather in a fairly direct way. For example, the ability of ships to enter a harbor or the harvest time. Right? A lot of these kinds of activities, they're almost like proxies in the sense that they're a step removed from the actual weather conditions, but they can still be useful, again, for testing model simulations. Right? If you find out that ships couldn't enter a harbor, um, but model simulations or proxy reconstructions tell us it must have been really warm, then something's off there. Right? And um, that often leads to interesting conversations. So that's the historical side of the equation. And there's also the archaeological side of the equation, where archaeologists very similarly can figure out um, when sites were abandoned, right? kind of try and correlate that um, to changes in temperature that we get using proxy sources, or when different sediments start to show up, maybe uh, sulfur. Uh, so, uh, sediments that we can maybe tie to volcanic eruptions. There's a lot that archaeologists can also do. And so what I've tried to do and what others have tried to do in the last couple years or so is develop what's called consilient climate history, where it's not just one person trying to know every field, but teams of people, all from different specializations, working together. Paleoclimatologists working with environmental historians, working with archaeologists. And that's how we really advance the cutting edge, I think, of the field. Yeah. I'm Joe Powers, and I'm not a member. And I have two almost completely unrelated questions. Um, I saw your, your proxy on ice, and I wondered if there's any effort to um, develop a method of uh, studying methane clathrates as the other kind of ice, like mm. deep sea um, frozen methane that mm. forms with seawater. And the second question is, you paid a lot of attention to the, the North Atlantic, but I wonder what was going on with like the Asian monsoon and the, mm. the East Indies. So if you could yeah. talk about um, Singapore and points around there. Java. I can answer that second question a whole lot better than the first one. <laughs> the first one is, sorry, but I'm not sure. The second one is, yeah, there has been work done on the Indian Ocean um, and really on global patterns of circulation during the Little Ice Age. And what we know is that during cold parts of Little Ice Age, monsoons seem to have been weaker in the Indian Ocean region. And at the same time, trade winds seem to have intensified. So there's a lot of weird things going on, and I think this is a really important question that I explore a little bit in the book, because of course these Dutch East India Company ships are sailing through this entire region, right? And one might think, well, if the monsoons are weaker, they might be moving more slowly in the Indian Ocean region, but they might be getting to the Indian Ocean more quickly because the trade winds are strengthening and easterly winds are becoming more common in Northern Europe and the Northeastern Atlantic, which would push them this way from the Dutch Republic. So there's a lot of different things going on and it's definitely really complicated. And what's really exciting to me is that we now have increasing numbers of proxy-based reconstructions for the oceans, for patterns of circulation, and for regions outside of Europe and North America which, and China, which have been the traditional focus of climate history. So the answer is, yeah, circulation patterns are changing globally, 
including the monsoon. And it had an impact on the Dutch Republic, which you can read about in the Frigid Golden Age. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Ah, we have a red microphone there. And then hopefully yeah. somebody will get uh, the microphone. Bob Bear, I'm a member. Um, Canadians claim to have invented hockey. And yet, <laughs> when I look at Dutch paintings from the Little Ice Age, it sure looks like they're playing hockey out there. <laughs> what do you think? So this is a question I'm ideally suited to answer as someone who was born in the Netherlands, spent most of his life in Canada, and now has come to you here. So <laughs> Home of the reigning uh, champions. Uh, yeah, I guess so. It's always really embittering, actually. Uh, the American teams always seem to win the stupid Stanley Cup. But anyway, um, so they're not playing hockey. It looks like they're playing hockey, but they're playing an early version of golf called Colf. Yeah, it's bizarre. But they're, they're in fact not playing hockey. So we have that. Well, if you play hockey on the ice and use, <laughs> and use, and use what looks like nets or backstops, uh, I it's think we're getting close. into semantics. It's fine, fine. Yeah, yeah maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Another question back over here? Yeah, I'll ask. Um, uh, Renee Willems, I'm not a member, but I am a Dutchman. Oh. Um, you talk about cutting edge technology to um, achieve the, the most accurate climate history uh, mm -hmm. data. How do you explain that there is still a, a large educated group of, let's just call them, uh, willfully ignorant people who deny modern day uh, uh, data, mm -hmm. scientific data on climate change? Yeah, isn't it so depressing? Um, well, you know, the answer has to begin with the massive misinformation, disinformation campaigns that had their origins as early as the 1980s, maybe even the 1970s. And you can read about this, or actually watch this, in uh, the documentary and book, Merchants of Doubt. Right? Uh, and it's not just in, uh, by energy companies, oil companies, but also in such things as tobacco. Really, they're using strategies developed by tobacco companies to discredit climate science. And that's anything from creating parallel climate, semi, seemingly climate uh, science organizations that then release bogus information about climate science to advertisements that obviously peddle misinformation. There's been this huge campaign. And despite this big campaign, 70, over 70% 70 of Americans now believe that climate change is a serious challenge. Right? So, in some ways, you can say it's been a massive failure to convince the public that this is a major issue, but I'm hopeful that that is changing now. So that, I think, is part of the answer. Another part of the answer may have to do with scientists themselves, who have, for decades, tried to motivate action on the international level, on the international scale, through international agreements, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because this is a global problem. But they have arguably neglected the local scale until quite recently, motivating grassroots action, right? And grassroots um, of public opinion. And it's now that I think we're starting to see that change through the work of people like Kathy Hayhoe um, and many other you know, pioneers of, of climate communication. Um, but perhaps climate science, sci scientists waited a little bit too long to start working on that local scale. Maybe. Hello. But I think the big answer is the misinformation campaigns that have been fueled by energy companies, unfortunately. So maybe two more questions. Uh, can we get a mic over here? Yes. Uh, my name is Jim Griffin, and I'm a member. I wonder if you could make any comments about the history of, of Holland before the Ice Age, maybe for two centuries. My anecdotal experience with Dutchmen is that they are generally intellectual, competitive, and cooperative. <laughs> and I wonder if it, the history of the Netherlands up until the Ice Age equip them with a society which had managed to make those properties coherent and therefore enabled them to perform better than their competitors. 
So that's a good question. It's also a very big question. Um, I will try and answer it relatively quickly. Um, so the history of, I guess we can call it the Dutch Republic, or the Dutch Republic really comes into being in the late 16th century. But in some parts of the Dutch Republic have a history that goes back to the high medieval centuries when settlers in huge quantities started draining the peat bogs of the coastal provinces of what would become the Dutch Republic. And when they did, as I mentioned, the land started subsiding. And when that happened, they had to start building infrastructure to defend against the sea, which was now becoming higher than the land. And as a result of constructing this infrastructure, they started developing quasi sort of national networks, right? They had to start integrating this infrastructure, these defenses against the sea. And perhaps it could be said that part of the Dutch natural, national character in the 17th century, anyway, reflected this long struggle with a uniquely malleable, variable environment. Right? In fact, the biggest environmental change, actually, of the first centuries, anyway, of Dutch history, maybe even now, is the subsistence of the land, right? how it's sinking. And so the Little Ice Age was just another set of environmental changes that they had already been able to adapt to before. On a similar scale, they had already been able to adapt to. So I think you could say there that there's a relevant history. And also, an important part of this is that the Dutch had a long tradition of maritime trade and of fishing. Right? And these were precisely activities that were influenced in a very different way than land-based rain-fed agriculture by climate change. It was just a different set of influences. And so you know, they were able to continue these activities that were affected in much more complicated, sometimes even beneficial ways, whereas other societies you know, still relied much more on subsistence, rain-fed agriculture for their economic base. So there's a, the answer can go on for a long time, but those would be two things that I would stress. Yeah. Is there one last question? If not, uh, if not, let's assume not. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming down here and giving this interesting lecture thank and you. Uh, present you with a small gift. Uh, thank you. A uh, framed copy of the announcement of your <laughs> talk by the signed by the members of the general committee and a signed copy of ah. volume one of the Philosophical Society of Washington, <laughs> reprinted courtesy of the Phil the policy studies organization, in which you can learn why they called it PSW. Okay. And who the original members were. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, we have a few closing announcements. Wow. Before we go, we have a few closing announcements. PSW depends on members and sponsors, without which PSW would not continue and would not grow. If you are not a member, if you're not a member, there were a few of you here, please consider joining. And if you are a member, please consider giving a bit more, becoming a sponsor or volunteering to help carry out the society's activities. You can apply for membership on the PSW website. On the home page, you can find all right, you can find the join button, which will bring up the membership application button, which will bring up the application for membership, which you can fill out. And when you've done filling out all the required fields and maybe some of the not required fields, hit the submit form, pay dues, and your application will be circulated to the general committee who will act on it within a week. Requirement for membership is an abiding interest in science. We don't have an IQ test, you don't have to take an SAT or an ACT, and we don't require a copy of your transcript. It's worth noting that PSW lecture attendance averages over 100 and is now averaging over 30 live stream viewers. These are modest numbers, perhaps, compared with the NCAA arena attendance. However, videos of PSW lectures have been viewed over 250,000 times on the PSW YouTube channel alone, 
And people have spent, believe it or not, eight million minutes of cumulative watch time watching these videos, which means that most viewers are watching the lectures in full. We also have 2,500 meetup members and almost 3,000 followers on YouTube. In other words, PSW activities reach a much larger worldwide audience than may be apparent from coming to a lecture. And it's your dues and contributions and sponsorships that make this possible. So again, if you are not a member, please join. If you are a member, please consider giving a bit more or becoming a volunteer. PSW is a nonprofit educational organization, tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. Contributions are tax deductible to the extent permitted by law and the IRS. And all PSW members in good standing can wear the PSW rosette. If you wish to purchase one, they are $15 and you may do so at the rosette table at the back of the auditorium. The next lecture will take place at 8 p.m. right here in the Powell Auditorium on April 12th. The speaker will be Mary Angela Lasante of Princeton University. She will be speaking on understanding dark matter, archeology span of the Milky Way, the mystery of the missing mass. This lecture is sponsored by PSW member Erica Kane. Thank you, Erica. Okay. The rest of the spring schedule is complete, except for a few details. The speakers and topics have been posted to the website. Details will follow in due course. Please check updates frequently. On April 26th, Kim Janda of the Scripps Research Institute will be speaking on his work to make vaccines against opioid abuse. On April 29th, just three days later, a Monday, we have a special event Alan Stern, the P principal investigator of the New Horizons mission that recently visited Pluto and a nearby object, Ultimate Thule, not really so nearby. Uh, <laughs> and Ron Eckers, who is the past president of the International Astronomical Union, will be debating the question of what makes a planet a planet and whether Pluto is one or is not one. This lecture is sponsored by PSW member Gene Shaw, and we hope it will be entertaining, not acrimonious, and also educational, as we consider the parameters that one has to take into account in coming up with a definition of planet. We should all keep in mind in preparing our minds for this lecture that the word planet derives from the odd motion of the visible planets in the sky as opposed to the stars, which is the reason the Greeks called them planet derived from the word wanderer. So don't wander too far and come see this. And then on May 17th, we have the 87th Joseph Henry lecture and our speaker will be Brian Keating and his talk will be on cosmic inflation and the beginning of all things, so I hope. In any case, that lecture is sponsored by my law firm, Miller White, Solano, and Brannigan. The social hour ends at 10.30. Please use the side entrance to exit the building. I will now accept a motion to ad adjourn the 2,406th meeting of the society to the social hour. Do we have a motion from a member? Several. Do we have a second from a member? Several. All members in favor? Aye. All members opposed? Meeting is adjourned to the social hour. <laughs>